Hello and good afternoon, church family. I hope you all have been blessed with not only divine service, but also the fellowship meal and the, the good uh, hospitality that has been um, born to each and every one of us. How many of you all are uh, essentially coasting from the high that we received this morning from Elder Preby? With that blessing, I'm ready to uh, transition us into the next phase. Let's have a word of prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for all that you have given us today. We have eaten and drunken deeply from the spread that you gave us in the spiritual word, letting us know that of a truth We're no longer waiting on special events to transpire. What the world is waiting on is for a people that is ready to stand in these last days to vindicate the character of God. As we transition into the next phase of worship, again, I ask that you will give special clarity to both our minds as well as the mind of Elder Preby as he strives to convey eternal truth and help us to take the theory and make it practical in our everyday lives. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. We ask all this in Christ's name, amen. amen. Without further ado, turning it right over to Elder Preby. Good afternoon. Hope you had a nice lunch and uh, maybe even got in a nap or two. I heard some meetings going on here, some little personal meetings in the church uh, uh, just a few minutes ago. All right, a couple of things so we know, all, we know where we're headed this afternoon. This presentation this afternoon, and then one more by me. It is called The Power of Forgiveness. That's a practical message. What I'm gonna be talking about this afternoon, this first meeting, is more of theology. The second meeting will be on practical walking with God. So that is our, uh, that is our schedule. Uh, I will be through with my presentations around uh, probably 5.30, somewhere in that, in that area. And then my, the last presentation of the day will be Matthew, my son's presentation. Uh, on, our, on, on the issue of the animal world and how, God, what the, how important it is for us today to understand the principles of how we relate to God's creation. All right, that's our schedule. After sundown tonight, we will have our material available for you to look at. If there's anything that would be of help to you in your study or for sharing with someone else, we will have that available after sundown. In addition to that, I always bring with me extra material, extra little booklets on various things that are, I consider really important, and uh, I don't have enough to give to everyone. So if you would like extra study materials, just ask me for it at any time during the afternoon or the evening, and I will be delighted to share some things with you that I consider important, and I think you will find them as, as well. So keep that in mind. Ask me for them later if you want them. And let's see, finally, remember uh, Matthew's instruction this morning as to how to get to our YouTube channel. If you want to hear any of our messages uh, on, the, on our YouTube channel, go to my website, dennispreby.com. Hit the big red button that says Dennis Preby Ministries. You'll get to my YouTube channel, and uh, there are a whole lot of messages on there as well. So that's our, present, that's our uh, uh, way of getting around COVID-19 and all the problems of the last two years. Put it out there so people can get it on their own. That's what we're trying to do. All right, now I think we're ready to go. I'd like to uh, start with uh, religious liberty, and I'm going to share with you an article that was written by an individual uh, that uh, had, a, had a personal experience with a neighbor, and I think we can identify with that. He starts out by saying, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. That means, among other things, that I keep the Bible Sabbath. 
I hired a man to trim my fields. I never asked him to work during what I consider to be God's Sabbath hours. As I was driving my van to pick up my friend, I got to thinking about the situation. We are not of the same faith. Our worldviews are dissimilar in several areas. But what if I want him to believe as I do? What if I, what, what if I could make hard and fast rules that would force him to observe my Bible Sabbath? Some well-meaning Christians promote just such a concept. They want their government to stand behind their Christian dogma, saying that to make our country great once more, we need to add political punch to religious beliefs. I turned to my friend and said, let me ask you something. This Sabbath thing that I'm so focused on, what if I could get enough people in Washington, D.C. to see things my way, to convince them that doing work on God's holy Sabbath, work that could easily be accomplished on any other day of the week, not only goes against Bible teaching, but is a criminal activity? What if I could make the Sabbath doctrine the law of the land and have the power to dictate what you can and can't do on Saturdays? Would you be okay with that? He thought for just a moment and then shook his head. No, he said, that wouldn't be right. And I pressed, what if, because of what Scripture says to me concerning how I'm supposed to live my life, I've convinced lawmakers to ignore whatever civil rights you might have once had and require you to behave the way I practice my faith. Would that be okay? Again, my friend thought for a long moment. No, he said, that wouldn't be right either. Religion is personal. On that, we could agree 100%. And on that concept, we must hang our every belief and every dogma. Religious practice is personal, not corporate. Religious convictions must derive from personal conviction. Look at the world in general. At last count, there were around 4,200 religions, and about a third of them were Christian. Christians base their beliefs on the very same Bible we hold in our hands as we march into church on whichever day we're convinced is the Sabbath. Yet our religions can be strikingly different, promoting worldviews that vary greatly. To those who desire to make adherence to religion-based principles the law of the land, the question must be addressed as to whose religion and which interpretation of doctrine is the one on which we should construct those laws. A TV preacher? A pious politician? The country in which I live, the United States of America, has done a pretty good job of keeping church and state separate. And those who don't call themselves Christian are free to work out their own salvation without government intervention. Religion is and always should be personal. That's the very essence of religious liberty. I thought that was well said in a practical way. How you deal with people that you're working with as business associates. Now, religious liberty is a great principle to live by in normal, peaceful times. But the reality is we don't live in normal, peaceful times, do we? As we've just learned the last two years. Since 1947... Just after the dawn of the atomic age, members of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists have put out what they call the Doomsday Clock. You may have heard of it. Shows what they believe is how close humanity is to destroying itself. Since 1947, it has been changed 23 times as they have evaluated what's going on in the world. And the clock's recent setting at two minutes to midnight which represents a high threat level. Says the organization, in 2017, world leaders failed to respond effectively to the looming threats of nuclear war and climate change, making the world security situation more dangerous than it was a year ago. So some say we need to take drastic steps. We need to step in and stop this or else. And if that weren't frightening enough, we're hearing about asteroids these days. Astronomers have warned that the Earth could be hit by potentially devastating consequences when an asteroid hits us. Even worse, in a world today where travel across continents is so common, the ability to spread disease, have you noticed, is deadlier than ever. Dangerous disease outbreaks are a part of our yearly existence these days, 
and given the right circumstances could threaten our existence. Time Magazine, cover article, May 2017. Warning, we are not ready for the next pandemic. Were they right? Yes. <laughs> Were they right? And if natural pathogens are not terrifying enough, humans can do a pretty good job of inventing pathogens as well. The Nuclear Threat Initiative warns that gram for gram, biological weapons are the deadliest weapons ever produced. Just get one of them turned loose somewhere. Rapidly producing and weaponizing biological agents is getting very easy. Now the real issue isn't whether any of these things are credible threats. Some may be, some may not be. What matters only is the perception that one of them might be deadly might harm our existence. Let people fear these potentialities and the masses will acquiesce to whatever power says this is the way to solve the problem. We'll get it fixed for you. Whoever faced with the prospect of an annihilation wouldn't opt for, si for safety over liberty if it came down to that. In the event of an emergency, freedom takes a back seat because we must survive. The greater the emergency, the further back it's seated. In anticipation of whatever awaits us, the United States government has, believe it or not, a plan, a plan to do what to do among, uh, in case of, listen carefully, a zombie apocalypse. That's what they're calling it, a zombie apolitics. A news report said this, from responses to natural disasters to a catastrophic attack on the homeland, the U.S. military has a plan of action ready to go if either incident occurs. It has also devised an elaborate plan should a zombie apocalypse befall the country. It's an unclassified document that can be read by anyone. Uh, counter zombie dominance put together in 2011, 11 years ago as part of a larger program for general training in regard to any kind of natural emergency. The report said the hyperbole involved in writing a, a zombie survival plan actually provided a very useful and effective training school. In other words, they decided to use an entertaining way of, uh, of what you would do in case of a zombie apocalypse to deal with whatever disaster would come all down the line. And they did a little tongue-in-cheek, but they were serious about working out a plan. They ended up, domestic law enforcement agencies will address any attacks until martial law is declared. Until martial law is declared here in our United States of America? That was in their own conclusion to the statement, and that's the point. Under a dire enough emergency, a new set of laws come into play and the freedoms go out the window. Okay, now, I think it's important that significant groundwork is being laid in this time of relative peace that we're still enjoying for a new set of laws. During the past few decades, a religious movement has gained widespread political power with a clearly stated agenda to dismantle the Establishment Clause of the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The Establishment Clause which requires separation of church and state. This foundational constitutional protection that the government cannot interfere in your rights to worship and to believe. Equal treatment for all Americans regardless of religious convictions. That has been a foundation from the very beginning and we are under, that's under severe attack right now. Since the confirmation of Justice Brett Kavanaugh, for the first time in history, proponents of this movement that, we're, that I'm talking about have a majority weight on the Supreme Court, and it's getting stronger every time one more is appointed. The most, and I'm gonna get very direct right here, the most open and vocal proponent of this anti-establishment clause agenda, get rid of the separation of church and state, since the death of Antonin Scalia has been Justice Clarence Thomas. Thomas is very un unapologetic about his views. He states them clearly. He tells you exactly what he believes on this subject. He joined Scalia in dissenting opinions that explicitly rejected 
the well-established legal doctrine that the government must be neutral. He doesn't believe that. Justice Thomas believes that it is not a violation of the Constitution for government to favor religion over irreligion and monotheistic religions over polytheistic religions. He feels that's exactly what we should be doing. This rejection of the principle of government neutrality towards all religions violates nearly 200 years of American legal practice. If Thomas' stated position were to become law, it would place all non-theistic and polytheistic religions, I'm talking about Buddhists and Hindus and atheists, at an official legal disadvantage. They would not be accorded the same rights as those who believe in one God. It would in, sense, in essence make them second class citizens in American nat national life. This I say is stated opinion. It's not just something that is uh, you know, talked about behind closed doors. He has explicitly stated that in his view the Constitution does not prohibit a state government from establishing an official state religion. The Constitution does not prohibit an official state religion. He believes the Establishment Clause gives states governments official constitutional license to establish their own state churches. In other words, you here in uh, Alabama could have your state church, a church in North Carolina could have its state church, Maryland could have another state church, that he per perceives is just fine. That's the way our first colonies were developed, did you notice? Some were Catholic, some were Protestant, some were Puritan, and he says, that's good. We want that. Uh, state churches are all right. Thomas has, been one of a, uh, has become one of a majority of five now on the Supreme Court with apparently similar views. Careful look at the expressed positions of the conservative members of the court for, forces the conclusion they have the same basic objectives to, to say that the rights of a select group of Christians to control the religious discourse in this country, to promote the rights of that group to religious practice at the expense of all others. Well, that's the legal part of this whole thing. But I'd like to shift away from legal interpretations for a moment, uh, legal interpretations of the Constitution, to the grassroots, where people live, the ordinary day-to-day -day living, the attitudes of ordinary people in our society. Because believe it or not, that's where the impetus to restrict religious freedom will come from, from the grass roots, not from the top down, but from the bottom up. Uh, that's where it will come from, not from the Supreme Court, not from a Republican or Democrat resident of the White House. It will come by when the people demand that we change things. A very revealing article that I want to share with you this, uh, right now. The waters are stirring more than ever throughout American communities. They have been for quite a while. One afternoon, way back in the mid-1980s, I was startled to see curious brochures placed beside weekly church service bulletins on the welcoming table at my local evangelical church. As I flipped through the pamphlet, it was apparent to me that some zealous individuals had taken upon themselves to judge the spiritual merits of all the hopeful candidates running for a variety of municipal and state offices. Candidates were graded on how they were perceived to align with a particular religious checklist. Some candidates were summarily dismissed because no conscientious Christian could possibly vote for them. Others were praised and heartily recommended. Yes, the signs that something uncomfortably powerful was already in motion were resonating in society back then and have not abated. Such phrases as the moral majority, Christian coalition, and the religious right have become increasingly familiar terms in the public lexicon. Shrewd politicians and campaign strategists were quick to see the benefits of courting churches and communities of faith. In turn, some faith leaders and lay people became vulnerable to the lure of political power and influence. And so, he says, began the dance. A romance of compromise, labeling, and polarization that would eventually stain all participants. 
good intentions snowed under by human weakness and temptations of temporal power. The fusion of a nationalistic agenda of faith and identity politics was emerging while a considerable section of the faith community and astute pol politicians played each other like fiddles. What is wrong with this picture? Standing before Pontius Pilate, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. Regardless, fueled by talk media, whose hosts can seem as much entertainers as political pundits, a curious hybrid of political conservatism and religion has evolved to keep the airwaves humming in a puzzling dialogue of alarm, frustration, anger, and pet mantras. Individuals are labeled and demonized while the devoted audience are kept on edge in a constant state of irritation and angst. One thing is certain, such broadcasters know their demographic and which hot button issues to push. By 2004, the country was in the throes of another election and I remember casually running into friends at a local shopping mart. The wife suddenly, yet pleasantly, said out of the blue, I don't know how any Christian could vote for a Democrat. Rather stunned by the statement and knowing full well that for decades Christians freely voted Democrat or Republican, I said nothing. The courtship between political conservatism and wide strains of the faith community charged by talk radio media rhetoric had morphed into its own type of religion. Myriads of young people have grown up in this unsteady climate with the perception that Christianity and a particular strain of political conservatism are one and the same. A 1996 article said, if God blesses us only as Republicans or Democrats, both politics and religion are in trouble. In America, somehow, may have, somehow many have forgotten that Christianity is neither Republican nor Democrat. There are believers on both sides of the political spectrum. A recent article, it is the strangest story how so many evangelicals lost their interest in decency and how a religious tradition called by grace came, became divine, defined by resentment. Christianity is love of neighbor or it has lost its way. The conclusion of the article, the hypocrisy, polarization, hate speech, shameless pandering for political influence and compromised principles have dragged the name of Christ through the mud. For what? Dominance temporal power, a place in government, seats on the Supreme Court, an effort to create one's own kingdom. Almost flying under the radar in this tense contemporary climate are the influential objectives of dominionism. That's a word you need to remember, dominionism. The theocratic idea that regardless of theological camp means or timetable, God has called conservative Christians to exercise dominion over society by taking control of political institutions. This school of thought emerged into the 2000s and is essentially seeking through religious political influence to build their version of a Christian civilization in America. Now keep this in mind. The theological basis for this dominionism principle is the belief that our job our job here in the United States of America is to prepare the world for Christ to set up his theocracy during the millennium. He will come down to this earth, he will set up a, gr a government that will rule the whole world for a thousand years. And America and Israel are the major players in this distorted view of the great controversy. The two nations that uh, they are focusing on. The article, one a little more from the article, Consider colonial New England in the 1600s and the unfortunate pilloried citizens locked into wooden stocks in the town square as punishment for lapsed church attendance. Or the individual who could have his tongue punctured by a metal auger for repeated transgressions of profanity. Yes. This was a curious sense of piety and justice dished out by early colonists who themselves had fled religious intolerance in Europe. Or consider an ailing Roger Williams escaping through the winter woods laden with drifting New England snow. 
he respected individual conscience. To, to Williams, a forced religion was no religion at all. The tragedies that occur when religion and political power, when they unite, stain the pages of history. All people, no matter their belief systems, race, or political persuasions, bleed the same. The humanity toward others is trampled when mortals play God. I, he said, do not recognize the Christ infused into today's religious political quagmire. He bears no resemblance to the Christ of the New Testament. That Jesus is obscured by today's religious political power struggles. My point here is not to tear down individuals or political parties, but to caution that in attempting to establish moral ground in our nation, we may actually be driving people away from God. It's almost like this a modern offshoot has scarred the name of Christ and Christianity to the point that many followers of Jesus have suggested believers use terms other than Christian or evangelical. That is tragic. The word gospel means good news. The Greek verb euangeliozo means to bring good news, the good news of salvation in Christ. Political partisanship has hamstrung evangelicalism's ability to pursue what is supposed to be the core of its mission, to share the good news of the gospel. One young believer stated, I feel that I'm in a constant battle with my dad to simply remind him that poor black people are people. Muslims escaping Syria are people, and they have inherent value and dignity as children of God. In April of 2017, the prominent Egyptian talk show host Amir Adib sat speechless after he watched a colleague interview a Coptic Christian widow whose husband had just been killed in a terrorist attack. The grieving woman spoke of the attacker in words that stunned the host and millions across the airwaves. I'm telling him, may God forgive you and we also forgive you. It's hard to hate at the foot of the cross. I recognize that Jesus. Please give my religion back, he concluded. I thought a very, very perceptive uh, uh, article. Well, if we're going to understand the movement of today, we've got to go back 150 years because of 150 years ago, there was another important religious event unfolding as we were becoming a legal denomination in 1863 during the Civil War. That was the development and formation of the National Reform Association. That is not the National Rifle Association, that's the National Reform Association, NRA. Their stated mission was to make Christianity the legal religion of the land through constitutional amendments. That's what they set out to do 150 years ago. Those forming the National Reform Association said that the original sin of the nation was leaving God out of the Constitution. This sin, they maintained, made allowances for slavery, for instance, and God was punishing the nation through the Civil War for not including him in the Constitution. That's what they were arguing 150 years ago. And it was gaining strength gradually through the next decades. It began promoting Sunday legislation. Ellen White devoted an entire chapter in Fundamentals of Christian Education to the danger of political involvement. A.T. Jones had to go to Congress, you remember that story, to speak against the adoption of a Sunday law. Here we are a century and more later, and this movement has revived. It's alive again. It is growing again. Has captured the loyalty of many sincere Christians. Now, how, how has all this impacted the Seventh-day Adventist Church? There's a fascinating story in the book of Ezra. Go to the book of Ezra with me. The Israelites were rebuilding the temple after the Babylonian captivity. Near them were some Samaritans who had been left in the area. Samaritans were an intermarriage of heathen colonists with the remnant of the ten tribes left in Galilee. And they claimed to worship the true God along with the ones who had been taken captive to Babylon. So go to Ezra and we'll start to read at chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4. By the way, you recognize that the book of Ezra is way out of place chronologically in our Old Testament. 
Uh, it's put uh, uh, right after the book of Samuel and Kings, and it's way down the line in, in centuries. Ezra chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Aser, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. So what do we have here? Their nearest neighbors were offering help, and they were refused. They were refused to help them. Why? Well, you have to go back to the book of Deuteronomy to understand why. So... Um, Let's go there. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And we'll start reading at verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 2. The verse 1 talks about the fact that the Israelites were to cast out the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and, greater and mightier than thou. And now verse 2. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Now Zerubbabel knew that these warnings that uh, had been given in, in Moses' time, and uh, they had just returned from captivity for ignoring those warnings. They had gotten themselves involved, intermarriage and religion-wise, with the people of the nations around them, exactly the opposite of what Moses was telling them here. So they were taken into captivity for ignoring these warnings. And this would have brought idolatry back into Israel. So Zerubbabel and Jeshua said, no, we can't allow you to build with us because you would destroy us in the process. They had to choose between a very helpful alliance. They will help build the city, manpower, money, and obedience to God. They had to choose. The leaders of the, the, the Israelites, the, the people from Judah who were coming back into, into Palestine. And so they refused to enter into a covenant with idolaters. Well, how does that apply to Adventists? In the 1950s, our leaders in the Seventh-day Adventist Church were approached by our theological neighbors. Now, who are our theological neighbors? People that think like us, people that worship the same God, people that believe in the same Bible, people who believe in the soon second coming of Jesus Christ. These people were our neighbors theologically, but they rejected the claims of the fourth commandment. They simply said that's not important, that's not uh, something we go by today any longer. They told our leaders, this group that had come over to help us, they told our leaders that um, Christians had misjudged Adventism. It was not really a cult, and they offered to help us prove that we were genuine Christians and they would stand by our side as brothers and neighbors. Well, that was the appeal of the Samaritans back in uh, Zerubbabel's day. We'll help you out. We're your spiritual neighbors. We believe in the same God you do. All right. Now, I want to read from Prophets and Kings, page 570 and 571. 
It is not the open and avowed enemies of the cause of God that are most to be feared. Those who come with smooth words and fair speeches, apparently seeking for friendly alliance with God's children, have greater power to deceive. And especially today, while Earth's history is closing, the Lord requires of His children a vigilance that knows no relaxation. But, apparently, I don't know, but apparently, our leaders in the 1950s did not read Ezra 4. Or something happened. Apparently, they didn't read Deuteronomy 7 that we've just read. Apparently, they didn't read this, chat, this quotation from Prophets and Kings. Because we gratefully accepted the help our evangelical neighbors pro wanted to provide to us. And so we adjusted some of our teachings, my friends, to meet their requirements so that we would no longer be labeled as a cult. Amen. Bottom line, that's what happened. Instead of rejecting their offer as Ezra did, we joined hands with the evangelicals and we have endured controversies and chaos ever since that time. Those were the seeds that were sown in the 1950s. But, you say, what was the title of this afternoon's message? Was Desmond Ford a liberal? What does this have to do with Desmond Ford? Everything that I've been saying to you, I haven't mentioned his name once. Well, after the 1950s, there was much debate about whether we had done the right thing. The book Questions on Doctrine came out, and some of our leaders opposed the book Questions on Doctrine. And eventually there was so much controversy over this book that it was not reprinted. It was left on the dustbin. But in the late 1970s, a respected professor from Australia came on the scene in the United States. And he became a sought-after scholar in our seminars and our camp meetings. And Desmond Ford was making a major impact on our understanding of righteousness by faith. The very same issues that were under discussion in the 1950s. Now here's where I get to enter the picture. At Pacific Union College, I taught shoulder to shoulder with Desmond Ford. By that I mean my office was right next to his office. And uh, we, we uh, had some of the same students in, in both of our, our classes. Desmond Ford was a colleague of mine. And here's what I know about Desmond Ford personally. He was not a liberal. He was not a liberal. He believed in the full authority of Scripture. He believed and quoted often from Ellen White. He used her rather extensively. He was a defender of the Sabbath, remained so for the rest of his life. He was a strong health reformer, better than I was during those years, the 1970s and 80s. He had high standards, and I never observed him do anything else than what a sanctified Christian would do. I never saw him lose his temper. I never saw him do anything that I would consider non-Christian, non-faithful. He was a, a, a respected Christian brother. Ford was not a liberal. He was a conservative evangelical. A conservative evangelical in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, not coming to the Seventh-day Adventist Church as they had done during the 1950s with Walter Martin and Donald Barnhouse. He was now within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, having a long history of teaching in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, teaching the very same things they wanted us to teach back in the 1950s. He built everything he was saying upon the compromises in the 1950s. He expressed better than anyone before him the essential hallmarks of the evangelical gospel. Unless you have forgotten what those were, I went through them last night. We are born sinners. We're sinners from the moment we're born and can do nothing but sin for the rest of our lives until death or the second coming of Christ because of our fallen nature. The nature of Christ was not our nature. Because if Jesus had taken our nature, he would have been a sinner too. So he had to take the unfallen nature of Adam, which had nothing within to pull toward temptation. 
Justification is the only requirement for salvation, not sanctification. That's a byproduct. Justification, if you have been forgiven, you are saved. That's it. And no one, and I mean no one, will ever be sinless before the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what he taught. And that's what all evangelicals teach. He was a conservative, Bible-believing, second-coming-believing, high-standard, sanctified, principle-living man, a conservative evangelical. And I'm going to tell you, we have much more to fear from evangelicals than liberals. Liberals, they deny the six-day creation. They don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about many millions of years. They deny the authority of Ellen G. White. Don't have to listen to her. She was very biased and very out of touch with today. They are the ones promoting gay rights. They are the ones that are kind of leading the nation into all kinds of disasters. That's liberals. Evangelicals, though, are so much like us. They are against the same things we're against. They believe most of the same things we believe. They're our friends. And evangelicals who share some of our beliefs are the ones who are joining hands today with the Catholics. They are the ones, not the liberals, the conservative evangelicals who would like to legislate morality, who would break down the separation of church and state. The evangelical gospel, listen to this, this is interesting. The evangelical gospel appeals to the liberal side of Adventism because sanctification is not important and sinlessness is impossible. So the evangelical gospel appeals to the liberal branch of Adventism. However, and by the way, you don't vindicate God. That's already been taken care of at the cross. You don't hasten Christ's coming or delay Christ's coming. That's part of the liberal agenda as well. Standards? No, nah, standards are just cultural. They change from culture to culture. That's the liberal side of Adventism. But evangelical politics is another story. Evangelical politics appeals to the conservative side of Adventism. I think I'm speaking to a, in a relatively conservative church, a church that is not interested in going down the liberal road of Adventism. Amen. And evangelical politics is appealing very strongly to this kind of Adventism because they are opposed to abortion, are you? They are opposed to homosexuality, aren't you? They emphasize the Ten Commandments. They want them posted on all buildings. Ten Commandments. They want to get Christians elected in politics. Wouldn't you rather have a Christian in, in, in political leadership? They like conservative radio and media. It talks their language. So evangelical politics appeals very strongly to evangelical, and sorry, to conservative Adventists. All right? Once again, Desmond Ford was a conservative evangelical and his beliefs have damaged the Adventist church more than any other single individual that I am aware of. And th his beliefs are now being advanced, promoted by, at the highest levels of Adventist scholarship. As witnessed by four books published in the year 2018. I have a message on that. It's called Challenges to Truth, in which I go over the books that Andrews University published during 2018, which identify 100% with evangelical theological beliefs. Ford, believe it or not, is having much more impact on Adventist theology today than when he was alive, when I taught next to him at Pacific Union College. His values have been slowly destroying the very purpose and mission of the Adventist Church for which this movement was called into existence as the remnant which would produce the 144,000. So conservative evangelicals will be in the forefront to bring about the union of church and state which will result in forming the image of the beast and enforcing the mark of the beast. And conservative Adventists are increasingly sympathetic to their political views. 
It's one of the most dangerous things I'm seeing right now in the spectrum of Adventist theology and politics. What I'm going to do right now is uh, put something on the screen for you, and I want to try to identify each point as we go through this. So we're very clear on uh, the issues of liberalism and conservatism. Here's first the Adventist position on various subjects. Scripture, we believe in thought inspiration, and we believe in the full authority of Scripture over our lives, and the only authority. All right? Salvation. Both justification and sanctification are needed. One is not more important than the other. Justification, forgiveness, and sanctification, power for holy living. Both of them essential parts of salvation. If one is missing, the other is gone. All right? Prophecy. We believe in a consistent method of salvation throughout history. All the way down the line, God has, ha has saved people under the same method. He has never changed. He has always saved people by grace through faith. And in prophecy, Israel is not significant. They have passed their time of relevance from Scripture. And so Israel is not significant to prophecy. As individuals, of course they are. But as a movement, they are not. As a nation, they are not. Creation. We believe in a six-day creation and a short-age earth. Second coming. We believe in a literal return with no secret rapture. And we believe that the millennium will be in heaven. How about truth and society? We believe in religious freedom for all. Religious freedom for one to believe in any religion, whether it's polytheistic or no religion at all. And truth is promoted only by persuasion, never by coercion, only by persuasion. All right, now that's the Adventist position on all of these major points of issue. Next, we're going to examine two other ways of doing things, the liberal position and the evangelical position. All right, scripture. In the liberal position, it's culturally dependent. The prophets wrote out of a certain culture, and they applied that to their culture, and it doesn't apply to our culture. Things change, times change, and what they said is not really relevant for much of today. Not all applies today. However, the evangelical position is quite different. They believe not only in thought inspiration, they believe in verbal inspiration. That every manuscript of the Bible, the autograph, they call it, the original writing by the prophet, is verbally inspired. Every word is inspired by God. Obviously, the Bible has full authority. All right? So which of those two is closer to us? And it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Salvation, the liberal position. Grace is based on love. Love is the only, really thing, the only thing that really matters. If a person is loving, that's the hallmark of salvation. And most are assured of salvation if they're loving. If you have love in your heart, salvation is pretty well guaranteed. However, the evangelical position, all are condemned at birth. We're sinners because we were born with a fallen nature. Therefore, we are under condemnation, and the only way out is we are saved by justification, by forgiveness. Sanctification is not involved in the saving process. So justification is how we're saved from our condemnation. Sanctification comes along. It's good to have around. It's better to be a sanctified person than an unsanctified person. But if you're unsanctified, as long as you're forgiven, you're saved. And that's where the question always comes out. Are you saved, brother? They mean, did you accept Christ as your Savior and did he forgive your sins? That's all they want to know. And if so, you are saved. Saved by justification, not sanctification. So there are some similarities there to us, but not completely. Adventists have never believed we're all condemned at birth. That's a new belief in Adventism. All right, next. Prophecy. The liberal position. The prophecies apply locally. Oh, there was a local flood that Noah prophesied, and it covered a certain area of the world. So it was a local prophecy. The prophecies of Daniel and Revelation applied to the local rulers of that time, and they didn't extend into our time at all. And basically, they were human spiritual guesses. A prophet is an enlightened person who can analyze the future quite well. 
And so that's what prophecy is all about in the liberal position. The evangelical position, ah, that word, dispensationalism. That says that God saves people based on different rules at different times. In the Old Testament, which they call the Old Covenant, mistakenly, the Old Testament is about God saving people by obedience to laws. And he saved people by their obedience and by their faithfulness to him, period. That's it. If you're a law keeper, you're saved. Then, when Jesus came on the scene, everything changed. Salvation was no longer by obedience to law. It was by grace alone, nothing having, having nothing to do with whether you are obedient or not. Remember, no sanctification involved in the process of salvation. Nice thing to have, but not crucial to salvation. And so uh, dispensationalism says that everything changed in the new covenant, as they call it, the New Testament. Again, the wrong use of the term covenant. And so dispensationalism says God changes his ways of saving people based on time situations. And now there will be another dispensation coming up when uh, things are going to go seriously wrong in our United States and the world and the Jews will be forced back into a position of leadership and crucial relationships with God in the final dispensation. That means that all of the Old Testament prophecies have to be literally fulfilled. You know, half of the book of Ezekiel, more than half of the book of Ezekiel, will never be fulfilled. Are you aware of that? It talks about Jerusalem re being rebuilt. It talks about the dimensions of the city. We're not talking about the Jerusalem that was rebuilt uh, in, uh, in, in, in the time of return from Babylon. This is talking about a permanent rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem with a temple, with everything involved in that. And all those Old Testament prophecies, including the sacrifices, must be reestablished. All of the prophecies of the Old Testament that were unfulfilled because of unfaithfulness on the Jewish part have to be fulfilled in the final dispensation. And that's why they talk about the temple being rebuilt. That's why they talk about Israel being the focus of prophecy. That's why I, I remember distinctly about uh, maybe three or four years ago when uh, the, the, um, the um, um, what's the word for the diplomatic, uh, the embassy being moved uh, to, for, uh, to, into Jerusalem. And the, the, the celebration by the evangelical world, another prophecy has been fulfilled. Jerusalem is becoming the center now of religious belief. And uh, there was, it, was a, it was a great uh, meeting together of evangelicals during that particular time. All right, so all Old Testament prophecies have to be literally fulfilled. Next, creation. Liberal position. Oh, God created but he created through millions of years. He stepped in and tweaked something here and there. He changed a few things, but it all happened by the regulated processes of evolution. Science has demonstrated that. So theistic evolution means God is involved in the evolutionary process. Theistic evolution. However, the evangelical position, six-day creation, short-age earth. Sound familiar? Same position that we hold on that subject. All right, next. Second coming, liberal position. There'll be no soon return. Don't look at that. Uh, society is going to get better, despite what we see around us, despite Cro Croatia right now, despite whatever is going wrong in our world. So society is getting better gradually. The evangelical position, a literal return of Christ after a secret rapture. Because we don't want the honest, the faithful Christians to go through the great tribulation and the falling of the plagues, do we? They've got to be taken away before that ever happens. So the rapture will take away the last generation of Christians, the faithful Christians, who will disappear from the earth and be taken in a special resurrection to heaven, a special translation into heaven, and, uh, and that will just take care of the problem and they don't have to suffer during the earth's final turmoils. No great tribulation for faithful Christians. And then the millennial reign of Christ. When he does come in his actual second coming, he sets up his kingdom here on this earth. And as I said, dominionism says, the United States and Israel are gonna be the two places 
where this will hold for he, Christ will hold forth for the millennial thousand year period. So that's the second coming of Christ in the evangelical position. And last, truth and society. The liberal position, we will have unity through diversity. We need a lot of diversity. That will bring us true unity. If we have everybody believing as they choose to believe and everybody lets everybody alone and don't say anything about anything, problems in society. All views have equal value. Yours is much truth as mine is truth. All of us have truths that are relative to us and there is no absolute truth. Everything is relative to who we, what we believe. The evangelical position. Religious freedom. Yes, they talk about religious freedom but they believe it primarily applies to Christians. Not for those Muslim terrorists, no, not for them. And certainly not for the Buddhists, and certainly not for the Hindus. Religious freedom is for Christians because other religions are lost. They have no Christ. They can't be saved. You've got to convert them to Christianity as we believe it. And that's the only method of salvation for all these other groups. And that, again, is dominionism. Christians will hold dominion, control, over the whole world. And morality must come through legislation. If legislation is done correctly, this United States will become the foremost power in bringing about, setting the stage for Christ to return and set up his kingdom here on this earth. All right, there you have the differing views on all of these subjects in the liberal view, and I'm talking about liberal Christianity, and in the evangelical positions on them. As you can see, some of the evangelical positions are the same as ours, but a whole lot aren't. A whole lot of these positions aren't even close to what we believe. And so uh, that's, those are the two. As we finish this up, I want to go back to the Adventist position so we don't forget. Scripture is thought inspiration, has full authority over our lives. Salvation, both justification and sanctification are necessary for salvation. Prophecy, a consistent method of salvation throughout history, no dispensations at all. And Israel is not significant to the final fulfillment of prophecy. Creation, six-day creation, short-age earth, second coming, a literal return with no secret rapture. The millennium will be spent in heaven. Truth and society, religious freedom for all, and truth promoted only by persuasion. Those are the three basic views surrounding us in our world situation today. Which are you most comfortable with? Which do you believe is God's will for us to live by today? And so I'm going to finish up by putting up some statements about how the Lamb will come to speak as a dragon, all of them taken, and all of the statements are direct quotations from Great Controversy 443 to 445 and one from 592. All of these are direct statements, although I didn't put them in quotation marks. All right, let's read them. Protestant churches that have followed in the steps of Rome by forming alliance with worldly powers have manifested a similar desire to restrict liberty of conscience. So Protestant churches are following in the steps of Rome by restricting liberty of conscience. Let's have a state religion. Let's get it right. Let's do what we need to do to get morality back on track. All right, next one. So apostasy in the church will prepare the way for the image of the beast. Not apostasy in the political world, not apostasy in even Catholicism, apostasy in the church, and she means the Protestant churches of America, will prepare the way for the image of the beast. Remember, the image is different from the beast. The image is like the beast, and this will prepare the way for the image to the beast. Next one. The Bible declares that before the, the coming of the Lord, there will exist a state of religious declension similar to that in the first centuries. What was happening in the first centuries? Compromise. Compromise on a whole lot of areas. The authority of scripture and how, how to interpret scripture. And Sabbath Sunday, that's where the compromises were being made in the early centuries. And, he, and she says there will exist a state of religious declension similar to that in the first centuries. All right, next. 
But there has been for years in churches of the Protestant faith a strong and growing sentiment in favor of a union based upon common points of doctrine. Have you noticed that? That the Protestant evangelicals, the ones that I talked about with all of their beliefs, are now allying with some very liberal beliefs, and particularly with Catholic beliefs. Just enough to work together on certain subjects. Are you against abortion? Okay, well, let's work together. Are you against gay rights? Okay, let's work together. Well, let's ignore the fact that we have totally different gospels, totally different methods of salvation, totally different understandings of prophecies. Let's just forget about all those things. But on uh, common points of doctrine, a union based upon common points of doctrine, a number of years ago, and I'm talking about 20 years ago now, um, articles were written uh, with a question mark at the end. Evangelicals and Catholics together? Really? How can that be? Evangelical Protestants and Catholics working together. But that's exactly what has happened. And the question mark remains. How can that be? All right, next one. To secure such a union, the discussion of subjects upon which all were not agreed, however important they might be from a Bible standpoint, must necessarily be waived. Oh, so you believe that um, we must pray to Mary? Hmm. Okay, I'll continue to pray to God. You pray to Mary and let's work together. That kind of thing. And we'll all just ignore the areas. And you believe we're saved by going to Mass and confessing your sins to a priest? Okay, I believe that we're saved by going to Jesus and directly receiving forgiveness from him. We'll work together. That's fine. No problem at all. Different areas of belief totally ignored, however important they might be from a Bible standpoint, must necessarily be waived. Do we have another one? The ministry of the evangelical Protestant denominations is not only formed all the way up, notice these are evangelical Protestant denominations, are not only formed all the way up under a tremendous pressure of merely human fear, but they live and move and breathe in a state of things radically corrupt and appealing every hour to every baser element of their nature to hush up the truth and bow the knee to the power of apostasy. Do we want to be conservative evangelicals, my friend, as Desmond Ford was? Do we want that to be our understanding of how God is leading this movement? One more, maybe. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. Now does that even hint at when the government of the United States becomes so corrupt and totalitarianism, totalitarian that they trample on our rights? I'm not reading any of that in a statement like this. When the leading churches shall influence the state to enforce their decrees, then we have an image to the beast. This is not about politics. This is not about who's in charge, Democrat or Republican. This is about churches enforcing their beliefs upon others. And I think we have one more. Ah, the image to the beast. What is that precisely? The rest of the quotation represents that form of apostate Protestantism, which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. It has to take Protestant churches to do this. It has to take religion to do this. This is not something in politics, this is in religion. And they seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. I think we have one more. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, 
will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. That's a hugely important quotation right there. Did you notice what kind of America it's talking about? Totalitarian, free America, it says. Even in free America, rulers and legislators will not propose a law. They will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. This comes from the bottom up, from the grassroots. This is a demand by people worshiping in churches to get it right, to get things going back on track in the United States of America. In order to secure public favor, it says, to get the votes, to get the votes, they will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. This means this kind of a thing will be debated in Congress. This will have extensive talking during this period of time in which the legislators will be saying, what should we do about it? And so this is not going to be a surprise that somebody will be just surprised that, oh, a Sunday law is on the books. This is going to be a process that takes place. Even in free America, rulers and legislators will yield. Now, who is going to making, be making that kind of demands? The ones that love their football games on Sunday and don't want to talk about the Bible and their bars on Saturday nights? Are those the ones that are going to be appealing for a religious law, Sunday law? I don't think so. The ones that are appealing are Bible-believing Christians that we know today as evangelical brothers and sisters. The evangelical dispensational position of theology. Desmond Ford's version of how we are saved. That's why this is, subject is so important. We're not talking about liberalism here. We're talking about conservatism. Conservative religious values in America will produce the image to the beast and will produce persecution and will produce Sunday laws. I think that was the last one, wasn't it? That's it. All right, so those are the statements directly from Great Controversy on those pages. I encourage you to read the whole section through again. It is really, really important reading for this time. Well, that's my little study for this afternoon. Um, Desmond Ford, friend of mine, good colleague, he has passed away, and uh, he set in motion. No, he didn't set in motion. It was set in motion in the 1950s when we forgot about Ezra and Deuteronomy, and we accepted some help from well-meaning friends. And he simply pulled it all together and made it a leading, vo he was a leading voice for evangelical conservatism. Be wary, my friends, of strangers bearing gifts. That was one of the stories of the Old Testament, remember. Uh, this, the, the gifts that are brought with pretenses of friendship, helping us get straightened out. Okay, it is what, about 523 right now, if I'm reading that clock correctly. So I'm gonna suggest we take a little break and in about 10 minutes, I will have my last presentation of the day. And as I said before, it will be a very practical. This was theological. It will be a very practical presentation. Justification's power, the power of forgiveness. Not mercy, not grace, just power, the power of forgiveness. All right. We'll break right now. Ten minutes later, we'll start it up again.
forgiving grace. Help us to be your children, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what I hope? I hope that some of you will fall in love with what is known as the 1888 message of righteousness by faith. The messages of Jones and Wagner from that period of time. I believe they are the clearest, most powerful presentations of the gospel in all of Adventist history. All of Adventist history. And today we're either ignoring those messages as if they had never happened, or we're openly opposing them because we don't like what they say. Which is no surprise. If this really was the message to prepare the last generation of people for the seal of God and for translation, see if we can get that up, for translation, then Satan is going to exert every effort to discredit the message and the messengers. He wants to run this place a whole lot longer. He's run it a hundred more, hundred years. He wants a hundred more. If this message ever takes hold of the hearts of God's people, his days are numbered and he knows it. So what I'm going to do this afternoon <clears throat> is just introduce you. Now I'm not going to talk about the messages. I am going to share with you excerpts from the messages. I would love for you to fall in love with the messages themselves. Find them for yourself, read them for yourself, listen to them for yourself, and understand what is being said. I'll make it clear where I, where I interject my thoughts, but I want you to hear directly from E.J. Wagoner this afternoon. One of the characteristics of light is that it may multiply itself indefinitely without diminishing itself in the least. A lighted candle may give light to a million candles, and yet its own light is just as bright. The sun supplies light and heat to this earth, and there is enough for all. Each individual gets as much benefit from the sun now as it was possible for anyone to get when the population of the earth was only half as great as it is now. The sun gives its whole strength to each person, and yet it has as much heat and light as though it supplied no one. Jesus Christ is the sun of righteousness and the light of the world. Just as the light of the candle is not diminished, by, although many others are lighted by it, so Christ's life is not diminished, though he gives it to many. Each one of us may have it in its fullness. The light shone in the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. Satan could not take his light because he could not tempt him to sin. Even when he laid down his life, he still had as much life left. So in any study of righteousness by faith, my brothers and sisters, we've got to start with Jesus Christ. We have to start there. That's the focal point. That's the center. Righteousness, our only hope, and our only power. Again, back to Wagner. The power of the word of God is best appreciated when you consider the work of creation. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. It is as though the world existed in the word before it took the shape that it's in now. When the word of God names something, then the thing that is named is formed. Whatever is described by the word exists in that word. The instant that his word goes forth, that instant the thing exists. Consider this text carefully. He spake and it was. Not that he spake and after that it was performed. As soon as he spake, everything was there. Whatever God's word says is because his word creates that thing. The word which is written in the Bible is the word of God. The same as that which created the heavens and the earth. All scripture is God breathed. The breath of God which has creative energy in it is that which gives us the precepts and promises of the Bible. That creative power is the power of the gospel. The power of redemption is the power of creation, for redemption is creation. So just as he spoke to emptiness and created the earth, so he speaks to the soul that is destitute of righteousness. And if that word is received, the righteousness of that word is on that person. So when, Christ declare, so when God declares his righteousness in Christ for the remission of sins, righteousness is spoken into and on you to take the place of your sins which are taken away. If you once looked lightly on creation, the force of the gospel is weakened for you. Redemption and creation are the same work, 
and redemption is exalted only as creation is greatly appreciated. Now that's a hugely important principle right there in that first uh, section. When God speaks, the reality exists at that moment, not later, at that moment. God's word is the reality and he speaks and it's there. It's already there. When he declares us righteous, we are righteous. Not we will become righteous sometime. We are righteous when he speaks and declares us righteous. There is no such thing as a declaration by God that we are righteous while we remain carnal and sinful and evil. That can't happen. There's no such thing as being righteous and a sinner at the same time as Martin Luther taught. This message is, goes beyond Martin Luther. You cannot be righteous and a sinner at the same time. You can be one or the other. And by the way, is it any surprise that Satan is attacking creation in the remnant church if creation and redemption are the same thing? Back to Wagner. It can't be doubted that there is power in the word of God for far above that of any other book. The word hidden in your heart protects against sin. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. The word has power to give life. Whatsoever, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. 1 John 3, 9. How simple. There is in the word that divine energy which can transform your mind and make you a new creation. When provoked almost beyond endurance, how the gentle rebuke the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men helps you to remain calm. The power that was in the word that was made flesh is the power that is in the word that the apostles and prophets have written for us. Many people earnestly long for Christ to come and dwell in their hearts, and they imagine that the reason why he does not do so is because they are not good enough, and they vainly set about trying to get so good that he can condescend to come in. They forget that Christ comes into your heart, not because it is free from sin, but in order to free it from sin. Christ is coming into your heart with the same power that created the worlds from nothing. So let's look back again at the eternal word made flesh. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, 1 John 4, 2. Note again the present tense. It is not enough, this is really important, it is not enough to confess that Jesus Christ did come in the flesh. That will not bring you salvation. You must confess from positive knowledge that Jesus is just now come in your flesh, and then you are of God. Christ came in the flesh 2,000 years ago. He did it once and he is able to do it again. If you deny the possibility of his coming in your flesh now, then you deny the possibility of his ever having come in the flesh. So the gospel, my friends, the gospel, the mind of Christ, the divine nature that we talk about so much is all based on Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, living in your flesh, in your mind, in your body. Righteousness by faith, simply Christ living in us, in our fallen nature, just as he lived in his fallen nature 2,000 years ago. Wagner again. Christ was tempted in all points like as we are, yet was without sin. He has met and overcome every obstacle that can possibly be bought, brought against your humanity in the struggle with temptation. And whenever the world, the flesh, and the devil meet him, they meet their conqueror. The victory has already been won, and therefore in Christ you have the victory. For when you are in him, the temptations assail him, and not you by yourself. When you hide your weakness in his strength, then his strength will fight the battle. What you have to do is to take the victory that has already been won, the victory that he gained. The glorious truth is revealed that the victory over every temptation and difficulty is already yours in Christ. Defeat cannot possibly be the outcome, no matter how formidable the foe may make himself appear. The battle is already fought, and Jesus Christ holds out to you the victory. You have to simply take it and say, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I say, what a powerful gospel that is. Well, we're dropping again. Let's try to correct that. Push it back. Push it back a little farther. Not far enough, maybe. Try that. Thank you, brother. Tighten this up as much as possible. Should be good. All right, let's try that. So I'm going to say that again. What a powerful gospel. So different from the evangelical version, which is taking hold of our thinking and our thought and our theology today. It is full of hope. It is full of courage. There is no defeat in it, and especially peace in our hearts. Do we need some peace in our hearts? Christ is fighting the battle with us. We are not alone fighting the temptation that is coming to us. Now, just a little bit from A.T. Jones. Mostly I'm reading from Wagoner. Let's go back to the beginning, all the way back to the beginning, and see what went wrong so that the gospel and the character of God became so distorted. If Eve had believed the word of God, she never would have sinned. If Eve had said, no, God said that I must not eat of that tree. I believe God. I do not claim to understand it, but he does understand it. I will trust him. And as long as she had continued to believe, she could not have sinned. Interesting thought. Now this is just as true today as it was in that day. And it is just as true of you today as it was of Eve that day. Today, if you believe God, you cannot sin. Christ in our human nature has demonstrated it. Did Christ believe in the Father? He didn't sin even once. Sin, my friends, is always disbelief of what God has said. We don't quite believe what he's trying to say to us. And remember, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The reason sin, any sin, is so serious, we are saying that God is lying to us. God is not telling us the truth. That's why sin is so serious. Back to Wagoner now. The flesh can't do anything good. The flesh is joined to sin, and there is no way in which the two can be separated. Now remember, flesh means fallen nature. They used the term flesh back then. Fallen nature is the term that we are more familiar with today. When your flesh stops trying to do the works of the law, you get a sense of freedom, not because the bondage is gone, but because you don't feel it anymore. When you were struggling to walk at liberty, you had a, con a keen sense of the chains that bound you, but when you relinquished your efforts and sat down passively, the power of the chains was not felt. And if you are blind to spiritual things, you might easily imagine that you are no longer in bondage but you have only the freedom that Satan gives. So long as you move where Satan wants you to go, you don't feel the restraining force of his bonds. The devil will give you enough rope so that you will not be unpleasantly conscious of your captivity. You know, sometimes we just say, well, I just won't do that anymore, and we feel free. We are free. Have you noticed many former Adventists who have given up their faith say they are free from the bondage of the rules of Adventism and the Bible. And they praise God for it. It is not freedom. It is just bondage in a new form. Now, how can we have true freedom? Not a false peace that comes by uh, surrendering to the flesh. The life of Christ is divine power. In the time of temptation, the victory is already won. The victory is yours before the temptation ever comes. When Satan comes with his temptation, he has no power, for you have the life of Christ, and that life in you wards Satan off every time. Oh, the glory of the thought that there is life in Christ, and that you may have it. The just shall live by faith, because Christ lives in them. And then he quotes Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 
The question is answered in a few words by the Apostle Paul, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The work of the gospel is to cause you to think the thoughts of God. We often use the expression, as free as a bird, and that exactly expresses the liberty with which Christ makes you free. If the Son thereof shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Imagine a bird that has been caught and shut up in a cage. It longs for freedom, but the cruel bars make that impossible. Then the door is opened. The bird sees the opening, but has so often been deceived in its attempts to gain its freedom that it hesitates. It hops down and finds that the prison really is open, trembles a moment for very joy at the thought of liberty, and then spreads its wings and wheels through the air with such rapture as can only be known by one who has been a captive. Free indeed. This is the liberty with which Christ frees the captive of sin. The psalmist had that experience and said, Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. It is the truth that gives us this freedom. The liberty which Christ gives you is liberty from the bondage of sin. That and that alone is real religious liberty. It is not found anywhere but in the religion of Jesus Christ. Your prison doors are already open and you only have to believe it and to walk out continually believing it. Christ is today proclaiming liberty to you. Believe his word, declare yourself free in his name, and then by humble faith stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made you free. Then you will know the blessedness of the assurance of Isaiah 40, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I say, what a difference from the rationalized freedom which keeps you a slave to sinful habits and leads to hopelessness and self-destruction while proclaiming freedom. What a, what a difference from rationalized freedom. Now I'm going to focus on one of the most misunderstood subjects in Adventism today, believe it or not, justification, forgiveness, and the new birth from Wagoner. Christians often say, I can understand and believe that God will forgive my sins, but it is hard for me to believe that he can keep me from sinning. These have much to learn about what is meant by forgiveness of sin. When you hear the word, son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee, a new life is begun in you, and you are a different person. It is the power of God's forgiveness and that alone that keeps you from sinning. As a free gift, out of the riches of his grace, he makes you righteous. What is it to be justified? Many think it's sort of halfway house to perfect favor with God. They think that the idea of justification by faith is that if you will only believe what the Bible says, you will be counted as righteous when you are not. All this is a great mistake. And by the way, that is the gospel of the evangelical church today. You can be forgiven and right with God even when you are not obedient. You can be saved while sinning. That's the bottom line. Justification means making just. If I could only tell you how huge that simple sentence is. Justification means making just. Hardly any Christians believe that. They, mean, they say justification means declared just. There is a big difference between declaring and making. And that is crucial in this study that, that Wagner, he, he's out of step with all of modern theology on how salvation works. Justification means making just. To be just means to be righteous. When you are justified or made just, you are made a doer of the law. You are obedient. Being justified by faith then is simply being made a doer of the law by faith. The moment God declares you righteous, that instant you are a doer of the law. Remember that to justify means to make you a doer of the law. That does not mean that Christ's righteousness, which he did 2,000 years ago, is laid up for you to simply be credited to your account, but it means that his present active righteousness is given to you. Christ comes to live in you when you believe. 
So it will be seen that there can be no higher state than that of justification. Well, again, I'm going to say the message of Jones and Wagner is not a repetition of the reformers' message. It goes beyond it. It goes deeper than that. Notice that over and over, justification is equivalent to you being made righteous, changed at that moment, changed to be a righteous person, which flies in the face of current theology in the Adventist church right now. We are not teaching that. Very, very few are teaching that right now. It's common for us to say that justification equals forgiveness and sanctification equals power. But that's not how they described it. The emphasis was on the power of justification by faith, the power of the change that comes into our life when Christ comes into the life. Justification changes us from the inside out, not from the outside in. This is the greatest miracle of the gospel. If I can be changed in my inmost being, in my mind, in my attitudes, in my values. And then sanctification follows naturally and easily as we receive more knowledge of God's will. All right, back to Wagoner. When you acknowledge that your whole life has been nothing but sin, and you willingly give it up for Christ's sake, you make a complete exchange, and have Christ's life from infancy up to adulthood in the place of your own. So you will necessarily be counted just before God. You are justified, not because God has consented to ignore your sins because of your faith, but because God has made you righteous, a doer of the law, by giving you his own righteous life. When you receive his life by faith, you stand before God as though you had never sinned. Your old life is gone, and the life that you now have, the life of Christ, has never done anything wrong. The life that he will live in you now will be the same life that he lived when he was on this earth 2,000 years ago. The works he did then, he will do now in you. Whatever sins he did not commit cannot be committed by you as you fully live his life. And then this principle is applied to the Sabbath. He called himself the Lord of the Sabbath day because he made it. He never kept a Sunday. Therefore, there is no Sunday keeping in his life to give to you who believe in him. His life can only impart to you the keeping of the Sabbath day. As he kept the Sabbath when he was on this earth, so he will keep it now in you in whom he lives. Interesting little twist right there. When we realize that the life Christ lived 2,000 years ago is not just credited to us on some books in heaven as is currently being taught but lived in us day by day, it changes the way we make choices day by day. If we are always conscious that Christ is in us at this moment, we will never want to dishonor him by selfishness or by cherishing sin in our lives. We just don't want to do that. A woman was bleeding, and her life had been slowly and wasting away for many years. She had spent all her income in a vain attempt to recover her health. Then she heard of the great physician and went to him. She was timid, and the multitude of people pressed about Jesus so closely that she could scarcely approach him. But she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. As she touched the border of his garment, she was fully healed immediately. Although Jesus was crowded and jostled by the people, he instantly detected that gentle touch. That touch was different from every other because it was the touch of faith and drew power from the person of Jesus. Something real went from Jesus into the woman. It was not imagination. It was an actual fact that the woman was healed. The words of Jesus to that poor woman show that she was healed in the same way and by the same means by which you are justified and have peace with God. Something comes into you that changes you from the inside. He said to her daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Nothing is said about forgiveness of sins in this story, but such faith as the poor woman had brought healing of the soul as well as of the body that day. The same thing is done in the forgiveness of sins that was done in healing the woman who was bleeding. The method is the same and the results are the same. 
just as something real though invisible went from Jesus into the person of the diseased woman, making her perfectly well and strong, even so you are to know that something real comes from Christ into your person as a repentant sinner, making you whole and free from sin. Many think that the forgiveness of sins by the imputed righteousness of Christ is something that exists only in the mind of God. They fail to grasp and to make real the living connection between Christ and them. The forgiveness of sins is too often thought to be illustrated by the payment of a poor man's debt by a rich friend. The record on the book shows that the debt is canceled. It is so different when God, for Christ's sake, forgives your sins. The sinless, endless, inexhaustible life of Christ flows into you when you have faith in him to cleanse you from sin and to make you walk in newness of life. Once again, forgiveness is so much more than crediting us with Christ's righteousness on some books in heaven. It is so much more than that. It is transferring from Christ to us healing, peace, power, joy, and forgiveness. It is transferring something from God to us. Back to Wagner. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It is evident that the Christian religion is a religion of the present tense. Now listen very carefully. In the Christian life, nothing counts for anything except what is present. The new birth is a continuous process and thus something that is ever present. Many who profess to be Christians always look either to the past or to the future. Christianity in the present tense takes you just where it finds you. Each moment will become now as soon as you reach it. Therefore, the only thing to do is simply to look to him now and believe now without reference to your past failures or future hopes. The only starting point in the Christian life is now. The only point attainable is now. It is looking to Christ now. It is when you forget to live in the present moment by looking at that moment to Jesus Christ for grace and strength that you fail. That is a really important principle. The present tense religion. The only important time for Christian living is right now. That's the only time we have. We can't look at the past. That's been ups and downs and we don't know what. We can't even hope for something better in the future. The only reality we have is right now, this moment, the assurance of salvation and possessing Christ's character based on the reality of the present moment. Do we have the mind of Christ right now? I'm going to insert here a few lines from Ellen White. Um, in uh, To Be Like Jesus, a morning watch book, page 356. She quotes from uh, Ezekiel 36. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of, sh of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And she, quote, and she says, Many who speak to others of the need for a new heart do not themselves know what is meant by these words. Satan leads people to think that because they have felt a rapture of feeling, they are converted but their experience does not change. Their actions are the same as before. They are constantly referring to the feelings they had at such and such a time, but they do not live the new life. They are deceived. To have a new heart is to have a new mind, new purposes, new motives. There is a daily, hourly dying to salvation and pride. Back to Wagner. One of the most striking miracles of Jesus is told in the following few words. Behold, a man full of leprosy, who, seeing Jesus, fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. The most striking feature of this miracle is the fact that Jesus touched the leper. Jesus does not despise you and is not ashamed to come into the closest companionship with you in order that he may help you. You see, we're all lepers, spiritually, every one of us. And it would be so easy for Christ to say, hands off, that's dangerous. But he touches us, and he lives in us. Whenever you fall into sin, it is because for that moment your faith has let go of the Lord, and you are not believing in him. It is a blessed truth that through faith you are shut in by the arms of the Lord and the evil one cannot touch you. 
Through faith, you can be kept from the iniquity that surrounds you, that is even in your very flesh ready to spring upon you. It is he that is pledged to keep you in the midst of the consuming fire of sin. You cannot endure it alone. You always fall, and the fiery darts strike into your soul. The prayer of David may be yours continually. Create in me a clean heart. With true faith, there can never arise any question as to works, for this faith itself works. It is impossible to have this faith and not have works. Since this faith is a living thing, it cannot exist without working. And coming from God, the only works that it can possibly work are the works of God. Christ himself, living in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, God with you, God revealed in your flesh now, today, by the faith of Jesus Christ, this and this only is living faith. Now, right here, we've got to make a distinction between the works of the flesh and the works of faith. The works of the flesh, now that's legalism. And the works of faith is righteousness by faith. The first does not save, the second saves. Both works may look the same. Let's use an example. It is a human work to decide to come to church on Sabbath, is it not? You have to make that choice to come to church. Another person comes to church for a different reason. He's afraid it'll end up in hell. He's afraid that if he does not obey, things are not going to be good for him. Or he wants to look good in the eyes of the people that he's trying to impress. You remember the story of the Pharisee and the publican? One motivation for the Sabbath coming to church is selfishness and pride. Let's see what we're doing. Wait a moment. We'll get it corrected. It's okay. I can speak with the music, but it's probably a distraction. It's good music. A button was pushed. And we're better now. Okay, distraction taken care of. Good distraction. Sabbath keeping can be from one of two motives. Selfishness and pride. Look at me. I'm keeping every Sabbath. I'm studying my Sabbath school lesson. Or humility and surrender because we love God. And he has changed us from the inside out. Amen. Works of the flesh, works of the faith. Two kinds of works from two different motives. God says to you, be still and know that I am God. You must be silent before the Lord. Or else you will miss the still small voice which alone reveals him to the soul. This still small voice is the same voice by which the universe was created. Think of the millions of, the thousands of millions of tons of water that the sun is constantly lifting up from the earth to the clouds to send down again in dew and rain. Not a sound is heard. The power manifested in the growing plants is beyond all human perception, yet there is no sound. It is the nature of a plant to turn towards the sun. But in God's spiritual garden, some plants try to grow in another way. There are some that try to grow by something inherent in themselves. Imagine a plant trying to make itself grow, exerting itself to become higher and stronger and to strike its roots more deeply into the soil. The idea is absurd, yet this is what many people think they must do in order to, be, to grow as Christians. A plant grows and reaches up and becomes stronger without any exertion on its own part. It simply looks to the sun. The whole process is simply an effort to get nearer to the source of its life. You cannot grow by looking at yourself. You cannot grow by looking at other plants around you. All God wants of you is to let him work in you. If you will look steadfastly at him as the plant looks at the sun that shines in the heavens, if you will make it your constant effort to turn toward him as the plant turns to the source of its life and to reach up more and more toward the brightness of his face, then you will experience no difficulty in obtaining the full measure of growth that you desire. One more point here. We tend to be pretty pleased with our strong points of character. I am this. At least I'm not that. This is a strong point in my character. Maybe we need to take a second look. 
It is on these strong points that people make their greatest moral failures. Peter's strong point was his boldness. Solomon was the wisest man on the earth. Moses' strong point was his meekness, but listen to him at the rock. Must we bring you more water out of this rock? People naturally trust in their strong points, but your weak points include your strong ones. You have nothing but weak points. Whatever point it is that you trust in, that point especially is weak. But you need not be discouraged because you find yourself weak where you had fancied yourself strong. In God and depending on Him, you are strong where you are weak. God has to reveal your weakness to you before He can save you. The devil, on the other hand, leads you to think that you are strong in order that by trusting in yourself you may fall and be ruined. But when you feel weak, too weak to do anything of yourself, you are in a position to gain the victory. If you are weak enough to yield entirely to the Lord, then you become as strong as the Lord himself, for you have his strength. The closer you come to God, thus getting a more perfect view of him, the greater will be the sense of your own imperfections. And one more sentence, just one sentence, from To Be Like Jesus, page 382. Christ pardons none but the penitent, but whom he pardons, he first makes penitent. So if you're asking for forgiveness, it's because he has moved you to ask for forgiveness. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking. We must always remember that everything good comes from God and Christ. We have no spiritual strong points that we can depend on. We are strong only when we realize our weakness and helplessness. Last page. Helpless, utterly helpless in yourself, unable to care for yourself a single moment, unable to resist the smallest temptation, unable to do one good act. But look again. An unseen power has taken possession of you. A new life has animated you. And lo, you have subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turning to flight the armies of the aliens. How about that from Hebrews 11? Where once you would have trembled and fallen, now you stand unmoved, like a house built on a solid rock. But even if you are the most helpless person who ever lived, God is willing to take you and work through you in the most marvelous manner by his mighty word. He loves to do it. He has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised. Hath God chosen? Then when you look and realize your frailty and your helplessness, don't become discouraged, but rather lift your eyes in thankfulness to heaven and praise that mighty one who can take you, the weakest and most helpless of his creatures, and by his word strengthen you with all might according to his glorious power. All right, my friends. Does this gospel have all the power that we need? God is eagerly looking for the weak and the helpless, those who recognize they are weak and they are helpless. That's a really important point to start from. Who see nothing strong in themselves, in their past or in their present. Who see nothing worthy or, or good about themselves, commendable, and who will allow God to release his gospel power into their lives, turning them into the wonder of the universe. Can you imagine Universe, the uh, people who are saved in other planets who, are, who have never sinned, watching a sinner become a saint. The wonder of the universe. An object lesson of grace, which be, will be remembered for, by all created beings for the rest of eternity. You know, friends, we will have another job to do if we are part of the 144,000 and live through the plagues and the last destruction, destructive acts of Satan. When we get done on this planet, our job will be to go to all the other worlds where sin has not entered and tell them our story. Because they don't know. They don't know what it is to be a sinner, lost, helpless. They have no knowledge of what it means to be a sinner saved by grace. And you and I will have the responsibility and the privilege 
It won't be a hard thing to do then, will it? Sometimes we feel we are witnessing to people who don't want to hear us. They will want to hear us. They will want to know how we were changed by the grace of Jesus Christ and by forgiveness. And you have a story to tell them. So will you pledge with me to be that people called for that moment, just like Esther called for such a time as this? We are in the time of the last generation, and we don't need to send it on to the next one, do we? I'm going to ask us to, uh, just as far as possible, just kneel together, and we'll have a final prayer for my last part of the day. Father in heaven, as we have just read a little bit of the message that was given to brothers Jones and Wagner over a hundred years ago, Lord, I pray that some of what they said may touch our hearts, that it may realize that we may realize that what God did in Christ 2,000 years ago, he is fully able and willing to do in us right now today, that we cannot be concerned about our past or the future, we are going to make present decisions right now, today, in this moment, to surrender to you. We're all pretty weak. We're all pretty helpless. And if we realize our helplessness, we have taken the first step towards a saving relationship. So, Lord, take us, this generation of sinners saved by grace, who will be able to demonstrate to the whole universe that the power of forgiveness is stronger than any other power known in this earth because it is the power of creation. A new heart, a new life has been created in us and we will never again go back to doubt and failure and discouragement. For the rest of eternity, we will live happily obedient and peaceful lives. And we'll truly experience for the first time perhaps real joy, real freedom, and real peace. So Lord, take us. Make this generation the difference maker in the whole great controversy. No longer delaying. No longer passing it on to another generation. No longer waiting and see what will happen. But making it our business to be the kind of people that are sealable. That are ready to become the movement that you have been waiting for for 150 years in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Thank you, Lord. We're going to trust your promises. We're going to be the, pe the people that believe you and will, be, and will experience the power of forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. I thank you very much for your listening to me on some very deep theological subjects. And I hope that some of them may give you some help. What we're going to do right now, it is 6.15. We're going to take probably no more than a five-minute break because we need to be on track. We promised, uh, uh, we promised to get you done by sundown. And so let's take five minutes, and then Matthew will have the last presentation of the day. I hope you can stay for it.
So uh, if we could do that before I get started. I'm not sure who's in charge of that, who can do that, but uh, I do want some of these lights to be uh, farther down. Nope, not that one. Okay, <laughs> I guess we need to fix that. All right, so now we have to get that fixed before we go any farther. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, while, while we're doing, taking care of that, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction. He, uh, he flipped that switch off and the projector went off, so that needs to be fixed there. Um, just give a little bit of introduction while they're fixing that. Uh, as most of you know, I talk about animals and nature, and I was here twice before doing so. Um, our first presentation, the first time we came here, was uh, to uh, talk about the impossibility of evolution. And we looked at individual animals, the ways that they're constructed and the ways that they are uh, act. Yes, that's getting better. Um, yes. All right, so now all we need is the screen back and then we'll be good. And uh, we looked at the ways they're physically built and the ways that they mentally behave and how all of those things give us information that is, shows the impossibility of evolution. And that's a very important thing to attack evolution because evolution is wrong. But we also need to praise God, and that's what I did the second time, showcasing the gifts that God has given to various animals and how they have been so specially refined that it shows that our God is bigger and more creative and more powerful than any ideas that evolution can come up with for how animals got to be how they are. And so we've looked at the practical side of creation science, both against evolution and for God. But that's not all that there is in the Bible about animals and nature and our interaction with it. It's not just creation science. It's also practical. And so tonight we're going to be looking at the practical aspect of it. And so we're going to be going into the Bible and spirit of prophecy to see what God has said about the animal creation as it relates to us, not just out there, but how it relates to us on a daily practical basis. And by doing so, it will give us a bigger understanding of sanctification because a lot of times we don't talk about this area. We talk about sometimes the theoretical areas, but we don't talk about the practical areas. And tonight we'll be practical. And so what we're going to do is uh, look at the spirit of prophecy and look at the Bible and see what dominion is all about. Because dominion is a huge concept in the Bible. And what does that mean in a practical way to you and me and to everybody? Because this is something that God wrote to the entire world, not just you and me if, or uh, the Bible people or the people a thousand years ago. This is for all people in all time. And so we're going to look at this. Are we having to <laughs> reboot <laughs> at this point? That's fine. We'll get there. And uh, so at this point, uh, like I said, it's going to be a little bit different than what we did the last two years. I usually show pretty pictures of animals. I show beautiful imagery uh, that we have mostly taken of, of animals that we have seen around the country and around the world. And tonight's pictures will also include some of that as well, but it'll go into a little bit more challenging territory. This last week, we were traveling across your southern states. Uh, we were started in uh, Arkansas and worked our way through uh, Alabama and, Missis and uh, through Mississippi and into Alabama. And I had the opportunity to be exploring swamps, which is something I dearly enjoy doing. Most people do not. And so we were actually in Mississippi exploring a fantastic swamp area and all the frogs and turtles and snakes and all sorts of critters that were enjoying that particular habitat. And so I was making sure to uh, enjoy that while I was able to be there before we traveled out of it. And I don't recommend that for most people, but for those who love it, it is something that is very, very enjoyable. And the life that God has put there is extraordinary. And I'll be talking about some of that life tonight as we go through it. But uh, it is something that I dearly enjoy doing as we get through the southern parts of the United States. Cypress swamps are a fantastic area for life. And uh, I would never get tired of what I find in those particular areas. Sure. Again. 
I am getting a, my computer is saying there is a signal, so I know it's getting out of my computer. All right, I'm not sure what to try next. Is it perhaps that uh, it's been reset to a different uh, input uh, channel on the uh, uh, HDMI is what I'm, we're using? There's always something new with the technology to give you a problem. That's, that's what I always find. I'll try plugging in again. It's odd that it's on, but it won't read it when it read it perfectly before. Same computers, same chords. Perhaps try a different input. Uh, maybe it's reading it somehow off of a different uh, option besides HDMI, even though that's what it should be. Yeah, try that one. No signal? No. We do have to have this. This is not uh, optional for my presentations. My dad can do most of his without this, but uh, I, I do not. There we go. All right. Thank you very much. All right. We're on track again. And uh, we will still be done by sundown, but uh, it's just, you know, there's no panic here. We're good. All right. So as I said, uh, this will now look at the practical reality instead of the scientific theory. One of the most deeply held beliefs of mankind is that human beings are the absolute masters of the earth. In our society, many of our practices impact on the lives of animals in a variety of ways. What is our duty as Adventist Christians to the animals around us? Is there any debt that we owe to them? Or are we free to ignore the results of our actions? This presentation is an attempt to answer that question from the Word of God. So now the first thing we need to ask is how will we develop Christ's character in us? Now we will start with a text that most Adventists are very familiar with. In Matthew 5:48, Jesus tells his disciples, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now this means we will need to have the uh, same character that God has shown represented in us. God's motives, values, and way of dealing with us as shown by the life of Christ, are to be our motives, values, and way of dealing with others. The importance of having this experience is found in Christ's Object Lessons, page 69. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Now, everything we should do should be measured by what would Christ do in the same situation. The character we develop now will be taken unchanged into heaven. Only the body will be made new. It doesn't matter if a person dies and is resurrected or is amongst the final generation that lives to see his coming. All will take the character they developed here straight to heaven. We are to make every effort to live on earth as we will live in heaven. Every right principle, every truth learned in an earthly school will advance us just that much in the heavenly school. Maranatha, page 327. So it becomes our duty to discover what the right principles that have been revealed to us to learn actually are. We will focus on one of those principles here tonight. 
what God meant by dominion. Now we begin with one of the more famous texts of the Bible. I've found that virtually everyone throughout the Christian world knows this text. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now this is the text always used to show that whatever we do to the animal world is acceptable and approved by God. It is the divine mandate that justifies any action that we choose. But are we completely sure that we have applied this verse correctly? What is the principle being given here? The answer to that question will determine how we apply that principle, the dominion principle, to our daily lives. For by him, Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Everything in this world was created for Christ, including ourselves and everything around us. All the animals were created for Christ. As Psalms 50 verses 10 to 11 shows, God claims all animal life as his own. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. We cannot own what belongs to God. The most that we can be are caretakers. In Genesis, Christ did not give us ownership of the animals. He gave us dominion. So what does the word dominion really mean? To find out, we need to understand what it meant to the original writers and readers of the Bible. In 1 Kings 4, verses 24 to 25, we have the same Hebrew word meaning dominion that we had in Genesis. For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, over all the kings on this side of the river. And he had peace on all sides round about him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree. Now King Solomon's dominion here sounds like a very positive thing. Further, Psalms 72 is a model of how a good king is to rule over his subjects. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish, an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. Now here is the key verse. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and the needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall he give unto him continually, and daily shall he be praised. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed." Now, I'm sure that we can all agree that this king is doing everything as he should. He has dominion over his subjects, and they praise him for it. He is blessed. This is a beautiful description of what dominion means to God. Yet there's more to it than that. Verse 8 is, re re is repeated in Zechariah 9, verse 10, as a prophecy of the Messiah. Christ is to have dominion from sea to sea, from the river unto the ends of the earth. As David says in Psalm 103, verse 19, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Jesus is our king. He has dominion over us, just as we have dominion over animals. 
to understand how we should exercise our dominion over the, our, over the animals, we must first understand how he exercises his dominion over us. This is the dominion principle. God is over us in the same way that we are over the animals. If we can understand this principle, we will have gone a long way to understanding our role in God's creation. Now we've seen in Psalms how Christ exercises his dominion. In Genesis 1, we see our dominion, responsibility. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Now what was included in Adam's dominion? One glaring thing not included is the eating of animals. Verse 29 makes that very clear. Adam's duty is illuminated further in Genesis 2. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Adam was the caretaker of Eden. He had a responsibility to it. It was a mutually beneficial system. Adam was the steward of God's created works. He was no tyrannical dictator, exploiter of what was going on around him. He was God's servant, taking care of God's creation. This is the beauty of God's dominion, that those he has dominion over praise him for it. Doesn't Adam's dominion here sound a lot like the dominion described in Psalm 72? This is God's dominion. This is how it was in heaven, how it will be in the new earth, and how it was in Eden. Our work in this world is to reveal the pure principles that are current in heaven. But we have Satan's counterfeit. But like every other principle of God, Satan created his own counterfeit version. He has warped our concept of God's dominion over us. God is believed to be a tyrant, a predestining God who chooses who will be saved and who will burn in hell. Satan sends natural disasters to wipe out homes and lives, and he has convinced us to call them acts of God. When children die of starvation, and when friends die from disease or accidents, we are told to lay the blame on God. All of this is Satan's version of God's dominion. And of course, there is a Satan's version of our dominion over the animals. Satan's dominion versus God's dominion. To find out Satan's dominion, we should first discover God's dominion. Whatever doesn't belong in God's dominion must fall into Satan's dominion. If we are not following God's plan, we are following Satan's plan. So let's start with the principles of taking life. So what is God's plan, God's dominion? Once sin entered the earth, humans were granted permission to kill animals. So our question is, when is it acceptable to take an animal's life? To answer that question, we must first look at God's example with us. When is it acceptable to take a human life? Under what circumstances does God allow or direct the taking of human life? To start off, number one, capital punishment. Spelled out in the Old Testament was a detailed list of crimes that required the death penalty under Israel's theocracy. Number two, self-defense. This applied not only to an individual being attacked by another individual, human, but also when Israel was being attacked by other nations. Number three, God's command. Israel was to destroy all the Canaanites out of the land, all of them without exception. When Achan was stoned, his entire family and household were stoned also, even though it was Achan who had committed this crime. There are many instances where God himself or his human agents killed people at God's command. These three categories cover the killing of humans allowed by God in Scripture. 
Now we can discover when it is allowed to kill an animal. The first category for humans, capital punishment, does not apply to animals. Since animals cannot know the law of God, they are incapable of knowingly breaking it. So the categories for animals are as follows. Self-defense. If an animal attacks a human, it is acceptable to kill that particular animal. An obvious example of this is David and the lion. But this cannot be expanded to the entire species, only to the individual animal involved in an attack. This is the same as with humans. We can kill a human in self-defense, but that does not mean we can kill that person's relatives or friends. To deliberately kill an innocent human who has committed no attack is murder. Likewise, we never have biblical permission to kill a predator, such as a bear, cougar, or snake, that has not attacked people or our pets. Preemptive killing is not self-defense, but instead is Satan's way. God's command. Two main areas are included in this. The first is animal sacrifice. The second is the killing of animals for food. Immediately after sin, God commanded sacrifice to begin. In Leviticus, they were structured and organized. All pointed to Christ's sacrifice and were intended to bring home to man the horror of sin, the vileness of every act committed against God. But what God commands, he can also fulfill. When type met antitype, the sacrificial system reached its completion, and Jesus made it clear that all sacrifice was to end. So now one area where God commanded man to kill animals has been repealed. The killing of animals for food started after the flood in Genesis 9. But it is important to note that key restrictions are given to Noah at the same time. The clean animals only are to be eaten, as specifically listed later in the Levitical law. But the more important restriction is found in verse 4. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. No blood was ever to be eaten. The Levitical law spelled it out in detail in Leviticus 17. Is this command obeyed by anyone today other than Orthodox Jews? Ezekiel 33 lists the eating of blood with idol worship, murder, and adultery as Israel's chief sins. This indicates how serious God considers this sin. Some people claim that this restriction was part of the ceremonial law done away with at Christ's death. But as we've seen, the prohibition against consuming any blood preceded the Levitical law by approximately a thousand years. It continued to be the rule for the growing Christian church after the death of Christ and was stated in official church policy. In Acts, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Paul supported this policy and repeated it in Acts 21, verse 25. So, far from being abandoned at the cross, the divine mandate never to eat blood was continued as a vital aspect of the Christian church. It was only during the Dark Ages that apostate Christianity ignored this as they ignored so many other Bible teachings. And I just want to say, in some churches where I present this, this is brand new material. To you, it is not. You had a, nugget, a health nugget this morning that already talked about that. This is something that you know very well. Last week, I was at a church where I per talked to a person about it who had never heard this in their life, and they've been an Adventist for a while. If the Christian basis for the permission to eat meat is from the Bible, which it is, then why don't Christians follow the entire mandate? Well, because bloodless meat is tasteless meat. All the flavor is in the blood. This suggests that the ability of the post-flood humans to eat animals is intended to be a necessity, not a pleasure. Ellen White confirms this in Councils on Diet and Foods, page 373. But on the same page, she also gives a second reason why God allowed them to eat meat. 
God saw that the ways of man were corrupt, and he permitted that long-lived race to eat animal food to shorten their sinful lives. Soon after the flood, the race began to rapidly decrease in size and in length of years. So in effect, it was a discipline for the race's wickedness. Those today who argue for meat-eating because the Bible allows it are, in effect, arguing for the opportunity to be disciplined and to have their lives shortened. If meat-eating was a necessity, that leads to the conclusion that when it was no longer a necessity, it would no longer be done. Many cultures in all ages have had a justifiable need for meat when better food was unavailable. But does that apply to us today in the United States and other developed nations where every conceivable food is available? A century ago, Ellen White extensively detailed how meat was not only unnecessary, but harmful. We are in the last days, the final atonement, when we should be striving to rid ourselves of the world's attractions. And as this is going overseas to many places around the world, I understand that there are places that don't have all the food that we have here in America or Europe or Australia. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about survival. But it should always be the last option rather than the first option because we are at a time when we need to be removing these from our diet, not justifying on the basis that we, we live in a poor area with no food available. Well, yes, that's true, but don't revel in that. Don't be celebrating that. Be, be proactive to find the food that is available that isn't requiring dead animals in this process. As God gives light to his people, he expects them to utilize it. After the fall, the eating of flesh was suffered in order to shorten the period of the existence of the long-lived race. It was allowed because of the hardness of the hearts of men. As we move into the 21st century, God has clearly spelled out a better way. Will we continue to harden our hearts to his will? The next topic, the, <clears throat> the principles of causing suffering. The next question we need to examine is, when is it acceptable to cause an animal to suffer? Again, we must examine when humans can be made to suffer under God's dominion. Number one, discipline. Spanking a child, locking up a thief, giving leprosy to Elisha's servant, wandering 40 years in the wilderness, letting cause and effect run its course in all its myriad forms, all are forms of discipline. Number two, to save life. An example is an operation that causes pain but saves the person's life. Removing a gangrenous limb, eating broccoli, one of the worst forms of torture ever inflicted upon humans anywhere, anyhow. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> so then what about the animals? But there are many in our society who say that the animals suffer much less than we do, or not at all. So that doesn't matter what we do to them. But why would that be, we ask? Because they're different from us, is the answer given. But what really separates humans and animals? What is the difference between us? Ask an evolutionist that question 50 years ago, and he would have glibly rattled off a whole list of differences that supposedly defined animals from people. Ask that same evolutionist that same question today, and he'll scratch his head and try desperately to come up with something, indeed anything, that separates humans and animals. Every difference evolutionists held has crumbled in the face of modern discoveries of animal behavior. Tool use, modifying of the surroundings, existence of culture, art, language, all are now known to exist in animals. So forget the evolutionists, and let's ask a Christian. Ask a mainline Christian what the difference is between humans and animals, and they have an answer that has lasted for over a thousand years. Animals do not have an immortal soul. Humans do. Easy, done. We don't need to think about it anymore, and it's all cut and dried. Adventists have discarded the concept of the immortal soul, but unfortunately the attitude toward animals that goes with it has been retained. 
Now this is very important, so let's take a close look at what the definition is of a soul. How was man created? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Take away the breath of life, and man ceases to be a living soul. Man does not have a soul. Man is a soul. Having a soul is good Baptist theology. It's not good Adventist theology. The Hebrew word translated soul in this verse is nephesh. So now what about the animals? In Genesis 7, verse 15, the animals enter Noah's ark. And they went in unto Noah, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. So animals have the breath of life. Does that mean they are living souls? And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature, nephesh, that hath life. Let the earth bring forth the living creature, Nephesh, after his kind. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, Nephesh, that was the name thereof. Throughout the Old Testament, the word Nephesh is used interchangeably for both humans and animals. We find the same in the New Testament, such as when the plagues are falling. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Just as man has the breath of life, and therefore is a living soul, so animals have the breath of life, and therefore are living souls. Scripture defines animals as souls identical to us, and any attempts to degrade animals as soulless are unbiblical. The only defining difference that sets humans apart from animals is having the image of God. That in its most important aspect means we have a conscience and can choose between right and wrong. That is the only thing that we can claim that the animals do not have. In terms of pain and suffering, there is no difference. We feel pain because we are vertebrates with a nervous system, and all vertebrate animals have the same nervous system and capacity to feel pain. Our vertebra protects our spinal cord. From our spinal cord radiates nerves that lead to every part of the body. The free nerve endings are what register pain, heat, and cold. All animals with a vertebra have a spinal cord and a nervous system like ours. Their free nerve endings register pain, heat, and cold like ours do. Animals with a vertebra are divided into five groups. Mammals, including humans, birds, reptiles, fish, and amphibians. All of these animals feel pain in the same way that we do. Animals feel with emotions. Animals have intelligence. They think things out and make choices based on their experiences. Entire books have been written documenting cases of animal emotion and animal intelligence. I could list countless examples of animals using their intelligence or showing their feelings. But I don't, have to, but I don't need to do that because there is clear inspiration that proves the truth of it. As we look at Ministry of Healing, page 315 to 316, let us remember three questions. Do animals have intelligence? Do animals experience emotion? And do animals suffer? The intelligence displayed by many dumb animals approaches so closely to human intelligence that it is a mystery. The animals see and hear and love and fear and suffer. They use their organs far more faithfully than many human beings use theirs. They manifest sympathy and tenderness toward their companions in suffering. Many animals show an affection for those who have charge of them, far superior to the affection shown by some of the human race. They form attachments for many which are not broken without great suffering to them. Animals experience physical suffering, such as pain, heat, and cold, and emotional suffering, such as loss, unhappiness, and terror. 
Causing suffering to animals is the same as causing suffering to humans. So since we have shown that animals suffer as we do, we can now go back and answer our question of when we can and when we cannot cause them to suffer. Number one, discipline. We use a leash to prevent the dog from chasing the neighbors. We spay and neuter dogs and cats to prevent them from hurting themselves or others. Where domestic birds nest, we put up electric fences to shock any fox out to eat the eggs. My grandfather raised many chickens for both eggs and professional showing. Sometimes his birds got into the very bad habit of egg eating. Now this is where as soon as an egg was laid, some hens would break them open and eat them. Now this couldn't continue, so my grandfather had a special solution for this particular problem. He would fill a few eggs with extra strong hot sauce, the hottest that he could find, and then put them back out for the chickens to eat. Soon it was very clear which chickens were egg eaters and which were not. The innocent ones looked as they always did, but the guilty chickens were wandering around with a dazed look in their eye, bill hanging open, panting, as they tried to recover from their last meal. Very soon, all the chickens were innocent of egg eating. It was a discipline that worked very, very well. Number two, another area allowed to cause suffering is to save life. Taking animals to a vet terrifies them, but repairing a broken leg or a surgery may be necessary to save the life of an animal. Giving them medicine or restricting their food is also sometimes important. Our next section now, the principles of caring for animals. Up till this point, we have looked at things we can do to animals. What about the areas of things we need to do for them? The merciful provisions of the law extended even to the lower animals, which cannot express in words their want and suffering. Now we could look at many texts promoting compassion throughout scripture, but the text that sums it up is found in Proverbs 12 verse 10. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. The first half of this verse is God's dominion. The second half of this verse is Satan's dominion. All contained in one verse. And wicked people do not go to heaven. Mrs. White expands on this. Here is a lesson to all have, who have reasoning powers that harsh treatment, even to the brutes, is offensive to God. Those who profess to love God do not always consider that abuse to animals or suffering brought upon them by neglect is a sin. The fruits of divine grace will be as truly revealed in men by the manner in which they treat their beasts as by their service in the house of God. Those who allow themselves to become impatient or enraged with their animals are not Christians. A man who is harsh, severe, and domineering toward the lower animals because he has them in his power is both a coward and a tyrant. If animals could speak, what deeds of horror would be revealed? What tales of suffering because of the perversity of man's temper? How those, often those creatures of God's care suffer pain, endure hunger and thirst because they cannot make known their wants? And how often is it determined by the mercy or caprice of man whether they receive attention and kindness or neglect and abuse? Punishment given in passion to an animal is frequently excessive and is then absolute cruelty. Animals have a kind of dignity and self-respect akin to that possessed by human beings. If abused under the influence of blind passion, their spirits will be crushed and they will become nervous, irritable, and ungovernable. Why do Adventists promote vegetarianism? Is it only because of our own health? If we think that the only reason to avoid meat is because it is healthier, then we are ignoring a large section of Ellen White's writings on this subject. She has as much to say about the cruelty to animals involved as any other reason. Even if meat was perfectly healthy, which it certainly is not, it would still be wrong because of the cruelty to animals. 
The following are only a few of her many statements in this area. I might fill pages with descriptions of the sights I have seen, the suffering among the animals that are to be used for food. When a sheep in a flock lies down and cannot rise, the others leap over or upon it as they proceed. A large box wagon follows the flock, and I have seen the drivers take up the heavy sheep, when unable to travel farther, and bounce them into the wagon right upon their backs. And I have counted no less than eight sheep, some already dead, and others in the agonies of death lying by the roadside after the flock had passed. But I will not go on to describe these sickening sights. If I had not, prior to this time, discarded the use of the flesh of dead animals, I should now take the pledge to eat no more meat as long as fruits and vegetables can be obtained. We saw a large, her large herd of cattle in the road ahead of us. Some animals had been wounded. Some were limping along. One poor suffering creature had both horns broken off close to his head, and the blood was flowing from the wound. Some were very lame and were pictures of brute misery. Taken from the green paddocks and traveling for weary miles over the hot, dusty roads, these poor creatures are driven to their death, that human beings may feast on their miserable, dead carcasses. Your wrong habits of eating have so educated your moral powers that you have not the spirit of a Christian. Your temper is perverse and your treatment of dumb animals is wrong. Not an ounce of flesh meat should enter our stomachs. How much? Not an ounce, that's really unreasonable. Not an ounce of flesh meat should enter our stomachs. Not even at Thanksgiving, come on. The eating of flesh is unnatural. Let them rather return to the wholesome and delicious food given to man in the beginning and themselves practice mercy toward the dumb creatures that God has made and has placed under our dominion. Will the people who are seeking to become holy, pure, refined, that they may be introduced into the society of heavenly angels, continue to take the life of God's creatures and enjoy their flesh as a luxury? Many who are now only half converted on the question of meat eating will go from God's people to walk no more with them. This is very serious. Ask yourself, are you half converted on the question of meat eating? This is not something to take lightly. This is a prophecy that she made. And honestly, I have seen this prophecy fulfilled in this area where people have walked away from the church because of their refusal to stop eating the animals that God told them not to eat. And it was step one, and there were later steps down the road, but it was part of that process that eventually left, made them leave the church. This is a prophecy that has come true in my experience. Think of the cruelty to animals that meat eating involves and its effect on those who inflict and those who behold it. How it destroys the tenderness with which we should regard these creatures of God. Animals are often transported long distances and subjected to great suffering in reaching a market. Taken from the green pastures and traveling for weary miles over the hot, dusty roads, or crowded into filthy cars, feverish and exhausted, often for many hours deprived of food and water, the poor creatures are driven to their death that human beings may feast on the carcasses. Some animals are inhumanely treated while being brought to the slaughter. They are literally tortured, and after they have endured many hours of extreme suffering are butchered. The question is often asked, is it a sin to eat meat? The only way to answer this is to see what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy have stated. As we have seen, to eat any animal with the blood still in it is totally forbidden. It makes no difference if it is clean meat or not. So to eat a chicken or a cow with the blood in it is as much of a sin as to eat a pig. Ellen White has made it clear that to eat meat when better foods are available is no longer permitted for us in these last days of history. For example, in a country such as this, where there are fruits, grains, and nuts in abundance, how can one think that he must eat the flesh of dead animals? We have plenty of good things to satisfy hunger without bringing corpses upon our table to compose our bill of fare. 
do you really want to eat a corpse? So to answer the original question, it is a sin to eat meat if better food is available or if we are eating the meat with the blood still in it, which is all the meat found in restaurants and on supermarket shelves unless it is specifically labeled kosher. The Bible and Spirit of Prophecy are very clear about this. And again, I'm not condemning those who don't have a choice. And there are people in many parts of the world that still to this day do not have a choice. And I'm looking forward to the day when manna is given again to those everywhere that they will not have to do so. But let's not use that as an excuse to do it because we have a choice. And it's really, really a focus of our choice, not those who do not have a choice. Treatment of food animals. In the century since Mrs. White wrote her strong statements condemning the way we use animals for food, we have developed a new way of raising animals called factory farming. The animals killed for food today are completely removed from the old McDonald's farm of the past. Fa factory farming is big business. Whatever is cost effective is the only consideration. Mass-produced chickens and turkeys are raised in warehouses. As they grow to full size, they become a solid mass of birds with no space to spare. Far overcrowded, they literally rub each other raw. The weaker are trampled to death, disease spreads like wildfire, injured and diseased birds are left untreated until they die. Pigs and many cows are kept in closed concrete stalls. They are fed whatever fattens them quickest, not what keeps them healthy. To prevent disease, they receive massive amounts of antibiotics, in the long run making them even unhealthier. And we're actually reaching the end of effective antibiotics because so much has been given through factory farming. There's a new documentary out called The End of Medicine as We Know It, which shows that very soon the antibiotics that we've always taken for granted as saving us from various problems will not work anymore. And the blame for that is factory farming. Pigs are, are actually as intelligent as dogs and, are, and, are, and have complex emotions. A worker in a factory farm each mo morning found all the pigs sleeping together in a group as one female had learned how to open her stall and went around the whole building to release all the other pigs every night so that they all could be together. Every morning, the worker returned the pigs to their individual stalls but then when evening came, the female pig freed her friends again. All farmed animals end up being transported long distances unprotected from heat or cold. To save some money, they are not fed or watered on these trips. They are pushed, dragged, prodded, shocked, and beaten. Many fall and break legs or hips or are too sick to move. Those are called downers and are left where they lie to die, however long it takes. If the slaughterers get to them before they die, then they will attach chains to their legs and drag them to the kill floor. It's still good, and it'll still go into your food supply. But if the animals die first, they're used for pet food. God's dominion or Satan's dominion? Most beef cattle and sheep are raised on open range land throughout the West. Any animal that even remotely competes with them are considered vermin and are killed on sight. The ranching industry is directly responsible for the eradication of scores of species. Little prairie dogs have been killed by the billions for no other reason than that they dig burrows and eat grass. Often prairie dogs are killed by poisons that kill many other animals. But sporting hunters will set up lawn chairs next to a dog town and shoot everyone who comes out of their hole with high-powered rifles, scoring points for how badly mangled the dogs get. The rarest mammal in North America, the black-footed ferret, depended upon prairie dog towns to survive. As the prairie dog colonies were destroyed, the black-footed ferret became virtually extinct. And so now, much cost and effort is expended trying to restore them to their previous homes. We now spend millions of dollars to save and restore what we spent millions of dollars to destroy. For not only do the individual ranchers slaughter the animals, the government's secretive rogue agency, Wildlife Services, 
kills millions of animals a year, mainly to benefit welfare ranchers. And how do they do kill them? With traps and poisons that kill anything indiscriminately. They corner babies in their dens and gas or burn them to death. All of this bloodshed so that we can butcher the cows ourselves in our meat-addicted culture. And don't be fooled by grass-fed beef and other deceptions. They might be slightly healthier, but they are just as cruelly treated before they are butchered. And just as many wild animals are destroyed by these ranchers as well. Ranching always means pointless deaths. Now, up to this point, I've shown some pictures which are unpleasant. And you're probably thinking that I went through the internet and found the most graphic, horrible pictures that I could find. The reality is, is that I went to the internet and I found the least graphic and horrible pictures that I could find. And my wife, Delise, is very sensitive about these things and she filtered the pictures so that they would be acceptable because they had a lot worse options to choose from. But the next few pictures are even more rough and if you have any and squeamishness, you know, feel free to not look at the next few pictures, but it is, a, you know, a bit of a warning just ahead. This will be the worst pictures we look at. Sometimes we need to see. Sometimes we need to know what really, in reality, is going on in our world. We rake the oceans with fishing nets that kill everything in their paths. Fish, dolphins, whales, and birds. 75% of the world's fisheries are at the maximum level of sustainable fishing. Any increase in the fish killed would cause biological collapse, a chain reaction that leaves almost nothing left alive. The other 25% of the world's fisheries are already at the point of biological collapse, with no chance of recovery. And when the fish disappear, we blame other animals, never ourselves. The seals, dolphins, and sharks become our scapegoats, and we wage war upon them. This is a picture of part of a drying roof of a shark fin processing plant in Asia. Every triangle represents one dead shark, as the only part that is used is the single top fin, the rest being thrown away. Shark numbers are crashing around the world to fulfill luxury meals of shark fin soup. Dolphins and pilot whales are rounded up in Japan and elsewhere and hacked and stabbed to death. They are not killed for food, but only because they eat fish. The ocean turns solid red with the blood of these innocent, intelligent, sensitive creatures. Is the unrelenting nightmare of the fishing industry God's dominion or Satan's dominion? Dairy cows are also confined extensively. Their life is a constant cycle of being impregnated, giving birth, and having their day-old calves taken from them. The bond between mother and calf is as strong as in every other large mammal, as a story of one mother cow in England demonstrates. When she gave birth, the farmer sold that calf that was just born to a farm and the mother to a different farm. The next morning, the farmer who had bought the mother discovered that she had broken out and run away, had no clue where she was. The farmer who had bought the calf came out that morning to discover the baby nursing from its mother. The mother had traveled seven miles to a farm she had never seen before to find her lost calf. What a wonderful example of motherly love and dedication. Female dairy cows are sent back into the system. They're useful. Males are taken to veal stalls. There they are chained in a two-foot wide box. They can stand up and lie down. Stand up and lie down. Nothing more. They are fed a nutrient-deficient diet to keep their flesh the right color. They are prevented from exercising to keep their muscles soft. For six months, they are purposely kept anemic and sick, all to provide their flesh as a delicacy. These young calves are children. If we locked a human child in a closet for a year, how healthy would that child be mentally and physically? Every glass of milk, bowl of ice cream, or wedge of cheese symbolically contains a slice of veal, 
you cannot buy dairy products without supporting the veal industry, for they are not two individual industries, but one. Female dairy cows are so bloated by growth hormones and milk-producing drugs that their bodies are far too large and easily break down or become infected. They are treated as living machines and are disposed of the same way. In 1899, Ellen White wrote the following. The light given me is that it will not be very long before we shall have to give up using any animal food. Even milk will have to be discarded. Now note her words, not be very long, as we find them again in a statement made three years later. Animals are becoming more and more diseased, and it will not be long until animal food will be discarded by many besides Seventh-day Adventists. Has this prophecy come true? Many people besides Adventists have stopped eating animals for many reasons. If this prophecy has been fulfilled, shouldn't the message from God given three years earlier have also come true? It will not be very long before we, Adventists, shall have to give up using any animal food. Has that time come? Or will we continue to play games with inspiration and God's will? The recent ongoing Adventist health study reports that 8% of Adventist respondents are vegan. 8% is not nearly high enough. It's just not. Disease has grown so rampant that even raising these animals is dangerous to our health. A century ago, Ellen White warned that there will soon be no safety in the possession of flocks or herds let alone eating them. 75 years ago, my grandfather was a dairy farmer and was an Adventist. But to be still an Adventist rancher or dairy farmer today is to ignore God's will. Now, I used to believe that since I ate no meat, I was free from causing cruelty. I could pat myself on the back. But in those days, I still ate eggs and was dismayed to learn how laying hens are treated. In cages two feet square, up to nine full-sized hens are jammed. They cannot spread a single wing. Their feathers are rubbed off, and soon they have open sores. In such crowds, cannibalism becomes common, so every hen has her beak sliced off to cause her intense pain when she pecks at another bird. Of course, all the male chicks are immediately killed by the millions. The ammonia buildup in the warehouses from the hen's droppings is so bad that workers must wear masks when they enter, but the hens are forced to breathe it 24 hours a day. Wire floors are not good for chicken feet, and often their growing toenails become enmeshed in the wire, and they never free them again. If they are near food, they survive. Come slaughter time, when their egg-laying rate slows, they are so violently removed from their cages that often feet and partial legs can be found in the empty cages, still attached to the wire floor. If you want to know what it's like to be an egg-laying hen, try this test. Get in a normal-sized car in a closed garage and bring seven or eight other people with you. After everyone has squeezed into the car, Lock the doors and never leave again until you are removed to be killed. That's the life of a battery hen today. I have a simple equation that I now use whenever I am tempted to have an egg, and I did love eggs. One egg equals 22 hours. 22 hours is the average time between each egg laid by a battery hen. 22 hours of absolute, unrelenting misery of an innocent, helpless, suffering creation of God. One hard-boiled egg equals 22 hours. A couple fried, 44. A large quiche or an omelet is worth days of suffering, all contained on one plate. God's dominion or Satan's dominion. And be wary of cage-free labels. That usually just means the hens are kept in a dark shed with all the same overcrowding and ammonia problems of regular farms. Standards are loose and deception common. 
a tiny outdoor extension qualifies as free range. It rarely means a grassy yard. Don't forget the standard procedures of cutting off their beaks and forced molting to maintain egg laying. What about the older hens who lay less? They are usually sent to slaughter like all the rest. And even if the hens are well treated, what about the useless males? They are destroyed without mercy. Cage free does not mean cruelty free. A backyard flock allowed to live out their normal lifespan is about the only way to truly avoid chicken cruelty. Everything else is a marketing ploy. Sport hunting and fishing. For thousands of years, much of people's food has been obtained by hunting and fishing. But with modern farming, hunting is now mainly for sport. There is no stronger indictment of the way we treat animals than that we kill them purely for fun and entertainment. Satan's hatred against God leads him to hate every object of the Savior's care. He seeks to mar the handiwork of God, and he delights in destroying even the dumb creatures. A better definition of sport hunting could not be written. Hundreds of millions destroyed every year in the U.S. alone, all for trophies and bragging rights. Safaris that kill one of every different species to have each variety of horns. To make it more fun, many hunters use as inefficient a weapon as possible. Bow and arrow users lose half the deer that they shoot. Those that escape end up dying by themselves from blood loss, infection, or from having the arrow penetrating deeper to a vital organ. State wildlife agencies build up game species for hunters at the expense of all other wildlife. North American hunters cause an average of 1,100 human injuries per year and around 100 human deaths per year. Human beings are dying due to the bloodlust of hunters far more than from wild animals. In fact, all North American human deaths by wild animals only average a third of what hunter-caused deaths result in. A rich dentist with a rifle is a far greater threat to your life than any bear, cougar, shark, or snake. And then there's sport fishing, which is merely hunting for fish. Now remember, fish are vertebrates that have a nervous system that feels pain just like our nervous system does. They don't show it like other animals because we can't hear the sounds they make without special equipment. Fish have the same social lives and emotional feelings as every other vertebrate. In South Africa, an aquarium had an Aranda goldfish named Big Red. Into Big Red's tank was put a severely deformed moor goldfish named Blackie. Now, Blackie could barely swim or move around the tank. From the start, B uh, Big Red sensed Blackie's helplessness and took it upon himself to be Blackie's friend. Big Red would pick Blackie.